All right, so let's dive into the active equity investing again. I know we spent a lot of time on this. Active investing is not dead. It's still act very important out there. And again, it's still the largest part of asset management. So we've got to understand this, but again, how are we going to construct this? As portfolio managers, we build portfolios and we need to build good portfolios to support our clients' needs. So I think one of the most important questions to ask, what are some sources of active returns? Why do we make money? Why do we not make money? So what's going on? It's important to be a detective here and really tackle this question of active returns. Well, academic le re research seems to support that if we get enough of the good factors, we're going to be rewarded with excess return. You know, what we talk about the hunt for alpha. You know, anyone that's in portfolio management, you're hunting for alpha. You want to find some excess return that you're getting by spending the same amount of risk that someone else is using. So again, if we get enough of these positive factors, we're going to be rewarded with excess return. Now, speaking of excess return, I want to give you something, kind of help you with this a little bit, this concept. So when I started out as a fund manager, I primarily focused on the large cap space. And what I found, and my team found, and other professionals had found this as well, but we tended to actually make a little bit of alpha by investing in founding uh, firms. So, you know, companies like Walmart, people that had strong family backings, and Dell, they tended to make a little bit of alpha. In fact, it was about 1 or 2%, sometimes even more. And we kind of thought we stumbled upon an anomaly. And this is how I outperformed my index for many years. Now, it didn't happen until about 12 years later. There are two professors, uh, Dr. Jerry Martin and Dr. Ron Anderson, who actually explained what that alpha was. It turned out that the majority of these founding firms, uh, when there was an SEC violation, it was about 60 or 70% of these founding firms that were the culprits. So what happened, you weren't getting extra alpha by investing in founding farm, uh, firms, but you were just being rewarded for the actual risk that these firms um, if there was something wrong with their financial statements, they were the ones, typically the culprits. So again, is alpha real? You know, those are things that you have to decide. I believe it's easier to get alpha in some markets, and some markets are more efficient, that alpha just doesn't exist. So again, we've got to have some exposure to these mispriced securities. So we're going to figure out what we're going to focus on, and it's got to be a driver of returns, or we shouldn't be investing in it. You know, our job as fund managers, we want to maximize the sharp ratio, maximize risk-adjusted returns. So we've got to identify mispriced securities, and we've got to be rewarded for these factors that we use to, to identify these mispriced securities. And more importantly, when we look at idiosyncratic risk, we're looking at that unique risk of the firm, we need to understand, did I just get lucky? Or is this a repeatable process and I tend to get lucky a lot more than other people because I have a better process in place? So again, those are some things to consider. We need active return. Um, if we're gonna active management, if we don't get excess return, then we should just be in, in a passive fund and, and walk away. Okay, so what is the portfolio construction process? So there are really three main building blocks of portfolio construction that the Institute tells us are important. First of all, what are the rewarded factors? And remember factors, we've been using this a lot. What are the drivers that we want to focus on in our portfolio? And more importantly, what do we want to underweight? Which factors do we want to overweight? And then we're going to have to have some alpha skill. Can I identify a mispriced security? And then the third thing, how much of a position am I going to take 
when that portfolio is found with a stock that, that gives me a unique uh, alpha, how much of a stake am I going to take? Some funds are limited to 2% of the portfolio. Others can do 20 or 30% or even more. The other thing that I want you to talk about, these building blocks, we're going to talk about this breadth of expertise. So I'm going to tell you the financial profession is very much like the medical profession today. Everyone's a specialist. It's very hard to find someone that's an expert in every industry, in every sector. There's just too much to know. So the reality is this breadth of expertise, you know, you may know a whole lot about the banking industry, but you don't know anything about technology. So let's talk about this breadth of experience. What we find when we analyze and attribute these active returns, managers with broader experience they're more likely to generate consistent active returns. Why? Because they have a process in place and it's not just luck. You know, every portfolio manager once in a while can get lucky, but can you do it consistently? And in some markets, unfortunately, you can't. It really tends to be more luck-based. So there's a fundamental law of active management and there's a lot of ways that we see this listed in the material. How you see it here in our portfolio, let me give you a different way to think about it. So when we're looking at your expected return, this informational content, this IC, what this is telling you is you are being rewarded for being right. And you're getting full value for this. Breath, I, the easiest way to think about it, this is how many decisions you're making. You know, if I send out 100 stock picks a day, a couple of them are going to be right, and a lot of them will be nothing, and some of them will be really wrong. So we discount this breadth by taking the square root. So the reality is, being an expert at what you're doing and actually being right, that is going to impact your IC Whereas just throwing out random stock picks and see which sticks and which is successful, you're not going to get full credit for that. So again, this is the fundamental law of active management. It's tested in a number of different ways, but just realize it's taking in effect the quality, you know, are you right or wrong, and then how many predictions you're making. And what we find, there is a direct link between breadth and expected outperformance, which makes sense. If I make a lot of picks, hey, I'm going to get right once in a while. Um, brings me to a question, or I should say a thought that I had on fantasy football. So a few years ago, I decided that I was going to compete in, in my friend's fantasy football league. And not only was I going to compete, but I was going to win. So I got all the data, all the reports, everything I could think of, and I made a lot of predictions. So. Yes, I was right sometimes. Yes, I was wrong sometimes. So how I could find myself being a better fantasy football analyst, I picked more games. I had more chance of being right. So this link between breath and expected outperformance, it makes sense. But you also have to realize if I make a lot of picks, maybe four of my picks are not very good, but that one might win. Same thing with stocks. You might pick 20 stocks and five of them do really well, you know, five of them do poorly and the rest kind of meander along. So we think this higher breadth should lead to higher active return, but at the same time, you have to pick investments and you have to be right sometimes also. Breath doesn't do it by itself. Okay, so let's talk about some portfolio construction approaches. Most investment approaches can be systematic or discretionary. Uh, again, systematic, I want you to think artificial intelligence, computers, quant, and discretionary, this is a person. There's some human being involved in the process. They also can be rules-based or opinion-driven. They can be bottom-up or top-down. They can be stock-specific versus macro. There's so many ways to construct a portfolio. The question you have to decide 
is what approach are you going to use and more importantly what are you going to stick with i can tell you when you've been in this industry for a while there's going to be sometimes large cap values out of favor there are going to be other times you're really happy you're a large cap value manager no approach works every time but you have to be consistent if you're always chasing the the right approach you're most likely never going to be successful so let's talk about at the end of the day, once you go through all this analysis, you are going to have to execute. Just like in sports, you can practice all day long, but at some point you have to go to the game and you gotta win that game. So let's talk about portfolio construction with unfortunately a lot of constraints. And remember from our earlier section, you know, the TTLLURR. So we've got our constraints and our objectives. These can be absolute. Hey, earn me 5% or more a year. Or they can be relative. Hey, outperform the S&P 500. Outperform some benchmark. Some constraints may focus on minimizing risk. Some may say, I want full exposure to this factor that I think is absolutely critical. And some of them, might just take a heuristic approach, things people have used in the past. Hey, take how much should I have in equities? Well, take 120 years minus the number of years you've been alive. That's a good estimate. These heuristic approaches, as much as we use quantitative and sampling and computers, sometimes these heuristic approaches seem to work pretty well. And if you haven't figured it out yet, the typical portfolio in the asset allocation section of the CFA level three exam, a typical portfolio is 60% equities and 40% fixed income. You're not gonna see a 30% exposure to alternative investments. There's no Yale model if that's gonna be your answer. Maybe there's a 5% exposure or a small percent to alternative investments, but we really stick with the bread and butter, stocks and bonds, and where do we start? I always started with a 60-40 portfolio, and I didn't move from that unless the CFA question forced me to move from that. So 60-40 is a great starting point.